Welcome. Today is June 29, 2022, and you're listening to the Caravan Podcast, a venture of the Herbert and Jane Dwight Working Group on the Middle East and the Islamic World at the Hoover Institution. I'm Cole Bunzel, a Hoover Institution Fellow and member of the Working Group, and today I'm very pleased to be speaking with journalist and author Michael Gordon. Michael is the National Security Correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and is the former Chief Military Correspondent for the New York Times. His brand new book, which we'll be discussing today, is titled Degrade and Destroy, the inside story of the war against the Islamic State from Barack Obama to Donald Trump, which is the fourth of his books on the wars in Iraq, the first three having been written with his late co-author, General Bernard Traynor. In Degrade and Destroy, Michael tells the story of the U.S.-led effort to roll back the gains made by the Islamic State, or ISIS, after it seized seized large chunks of territory in Iraq and Syria in 2013 and 2014. That is to, quote, degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS, as President Obama put it in a speech in September 2014. It's a fascinating account that takes you behind the scenes, everywhere from the senior most deliberations at the White House to the grinding battlefield triumphs and tragedies in Iraq and Syria. And it has a lot to say about the current state of affairs in the region as well. Michael, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Right. Thank you. So as I as I alluded to above, uh, you're the author of what is now a tetralogy of books on the Iraq wars. I don't know if it's the last, but uh, it's been it's many, many pages on Iraq. Uh, The first book was on the first Gulf War, the second on the 2003 invasion, the third was on the struggle for Iraq from George Bush to Barack Obama, and now this fourth book is on the campaign to degrade and destroy the Islamic State. So I'm curious, first of all, if you could tell us what was different this time around when it came to to writing this book. What was different about the U.S. effort against the Islamic State compared to previous U.S. military forays in Iraq? Well, one thing that was different about this book is I did the first three with my partner, um, a retired general, uh, Mick Trainer, who unfortunately passed away. And I did this one solo, but I I did it in the same spirit. And the way we approached these books was that we weren't trying to be the first out of the gate. We were trying to do a a work that would endure, that would be um, a contribution uh, that would people years from now would return to for a, um, a record of what transpired in the war. And one thing I, I learned in doing these books was that um, you really have to report them intensively and quickly right after the event occurs. You can't wait years for documents to be declassified because they never really are and so much is not really written down. But you have to um, re- write it in a kind of a painstaking and methodical way. So the goal with with Trainer and I was always to try to get as close to ground truth as we could and keep the ideology out of it. Um, What um, in this conflict, you know, all the the wars and I was in all all of these wars uh, as a a correspondent on the ground in the field. But uh, the the first war uh, was notable, uh, the Gulf War, Desert Storm, for really being the application of overwhelming force, but with limited aims a massive number of troops, a very broad coalition, including Syria, Egypt, Gulf states, France, Britain. But the goal was limited to evict Saddam Hussein's uh, troops from Kuwait and uh, deliver a body blow to the Republican Guard. Uh, That was Desert Storm. Uh, The second uh, war, um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, the invasion of Iraq, had a, a, a much a uh, smaller force, but vastly <laughs> expanding, expanded uh, objectives uh, to topple a dictator, occupy a country and install a democratic regime in the heart of the Arab world, uh, which they hoped, uh, the Bush administration hoped would have a catalytic effect on the region. Uh, so the third war, uh, Inherent Resolve, the counter ISIS campaign, was very much influenced by um, the American public and politicians' reaction to the two previous wars. They wanted to destroy ISIS, but they certainly weren't going to deploy a large number of American troops to do it, nor did they want the Americans to be the principal combatants on the ground. In the air, yes, but not on the ground. So the concept was to use a small force, small teams of advisors, um, partnered with the Iraqi military, the Kurdish Peshmerga, and whoever you could find in Syria to join our side, 
uh, to go after uh, the Islamic State. I would say at the very start, the concept was embryonic and it evolved over time. So when does it uh, become associated with this phrase by, with, and through? And could you explain what that means? Well, if you go back in special forces history, uh, uh, special forces, and I was recently down at um, Fort Bragg, soon to be named Fort Liberty, um, is, um, you know, it, it's a special forces term, which means you work, you work primarily through partners. You work um, by, with, and through partners. They are the principal fighting force. You're an advisory element, and uh, and um, and it's something that is well known in the kind of special operations community, but it's not generally applied uh, more broadly in, in in major conflicts. And what was different in this case was that when President Obama sent troops back to Iraq, he sent them basically to advise and train the Iraqi army and have the Iraqis do the main fighting. In fact, at the onset of the campaign, U.S. advisors were not even allowed to leave bases. They were within the wire trying to do remote advising for Iraqi forces in the field, a practice that didn't work very well in terms of uh, building momentum on the battlefield. And it got expanded, the uh, latitude of the advisors got expanded over time to the point where they were in the battlefield, though not doing the main fighting, a little bit behind the lines, but close enough that they could see what was happening and call in airstrikes. And that process really took a couple years. It was a learning experience for the Obama administration. And the guys on the ground were um, tied into a very substantial reconnaissance uh, intelligence surveillance network that could uh, identify developments on the battlefield and substantial air power. So it's a pretty potent combination, a relatively small number of troops, uh, coupled with a larger number of partner forces who can leverage air power and reconnaissance uh, can, can be a, quite a lethal um, force on the battlefield. And that's what, that's what um, happened in the counter ISIS campaign, although it took a, a couple of years for it to gain momentum. So I want to go back in time just a little bit uh, to what some see as one of the principal reasons for the rise of ISIS in 2013, 2014, and that is the failure of the Obama administration to achieve what is called a new status of forces agreement or SOFA with the government uh, in Baghdad in 2011, something that you write about uh, in the book. This, of course, would have allowed for forces to have legal immunity like, like our diplomats do. Um, of course, all the troops were withdrawn by December 2011. Uh, so what is the story uh, here? Why, why didn't the troops stay and how consequential in your view was the fact that we had this full withdrawal at the end of 2011? Well, the principal reason for the rise of ISIS really, I think, has nothing to do with the U.S., has everything to do with the Iraqis and the divisions between Sunni, Shia, and their own difficulties in forming a cohesive and unified uh, government that re represents a diverse array of interests. And, um, you know, coming beginning with the American invasion of Iraq, um, the Sunnis were dislodged from their favorite position at the top of the hierarchy in Iraq, and the Shia were empowered. And there was obviously deep enmity between uh, the two groups. When the U.S. was an occupying power in Iraq, it was more or less kept in check because the U.S. had more influence, wasta, and clout within the country to do that. But um, under uh, Prime Minister Maliki, his impulses were really at, at base were pretty sectarian, and he took actions that aggravated these tensions. And as a consequence of that, um, the Sunnis, um, as particularly disenfranchised Sunnis, became more receptive uh, to jihadist influences and um, in, in Anbar and in northern Iraq. An aggravating factor, as you point out, uh, was the departure of American troops in 2011. And, and without American forces there, uh, one, um, Washington did not um, foresee uh, the rise of ISIS in time uh, in order to react, even though it was foreseen and by uh, the U.S. special operations community, and they indeed warned of it, but um, 
to no avail. The White House turned a deaf ear to that. But the, the uh, Washington didn't foresee it. Also, they weren't in a position to mitigate uh, Maliki's worst sectarian impulses and to arrest the deterioration of the Iraqi army the way we would have been if we had had five or 10,000 troops there to do mentoring and training. Now, as to why American troops left, the Bush administration successfully negotiated a SOFA agreement, a status of forces agreement. Uh, and uh, it was due to expire at the end of 2011. And the Bush administration's concept was that it would merely be extended. But when the Obama administration came in, uh, they raised the bar for what constituted a um, satisfactory SOFA. And it required not merely approval by the Iraqi government, but it also requ required approval by the Iraqi parliament. And that was, uh, for Maliki, that was a bridge too far. He didn't want to take this agreement to the Iraqi parliament. And uh, I think perhaps he thought it would be a hard fight. He didn't want to be in the position of having to argue that he needed American help. It, you know, his party was called state of law. He positioned himself as a sort of a, a stalwart figure in Iraqi politics. And he made it clear to the Americans that that was a step he wouldn't take. He wouldn't take, he was willing to sign an agreement. He was willing to do an executive agreement, but he wasn't willing to take this agreement to the parliament. But for President Obama, it was a requirement and they could never get over that hurdle. So um, as a consequence of that, U.S. forces left um, um, Iraq at the end of 2011. And I would say that everybody in the U.S. military and everybody in the Iraqi military at a senior level understood that it was an imperative that U.S. forces remain in Iraq past 2011 in a mentoring, training, advisory, enabling role, not as a primary combatant, but the politicians in Baghdad and the politicians in Washington couldn't overcome their own domestic politics. Um, and as a consequence, uh, the negotiations failed. It's also um, noteworthy that uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Maliki did not have a good relationship. Uh, George Bush, who um, saw Iraq as a special project, was talking to Maliki all the time. But um, uh, President Obama talked to Maliki to start the um, SOFA talks and then to end them and never in between which showed the degree of estrangement between these uh, two leaders. The end result was U.S. forces were not in Iraq in any substantial way. Um, the rise of ISIS was not given sufficient attention. Iraqi sectarian divisions, which were already great and aggravated by Maliki, uh, became deeper. And we had to go back in all over again. So one of the reasons I, I bring this up is because I remember reading all these stories in 2011 about the SOFA agreement and the, uh, the difficulty that we had in trying to achieve one and, and that this was the reason uh, why we had to leave. And there was a big partisan brawl um, in the newspapers over this. Um, but then when ISIS starts seizing territory in Iraq in, in January 2014, I think that's when they take Fallujah and then Mosul in July, um, and then U.S. forces go back into Iraq in August 2014, I read almost nothing about this issue. And it made me think, well, well gosh, what, well, what was that all about? And so, so how was this issue effectively just sidestepped uh, a few years later? Because when governments want to act, they do act. And when they're looking for an excuse not to act, they find recourse in the law. And the Ob President Obama, and I had interviewed him in Chicago when he was a candidate, he had campaigned on a platform of ending the war in Iraq and turning the page on Iraq. And he was prepared to stay in a training role, but his bar for remaining in that capacity was high. Parliamentary approval. Mm -hmm. By the time ISIS had taken over Iraq's second largest city, which was a huge setback, not for the Obama administration, not merely in Iraq, but for its, its broader policy, in the region that had come in to end wars, not rejoin them. Um, uh, somehow standing up the Iraqis and helping them fight um, this terrorist army became an imperative. And Iraq was in a total state of disarray. And it was in, it was in no, uh, 
you know, one requirement that President Obama had was that there be a, a new government in Iraq, that Maliki no longer be there. He achieved that. It was simply impractical to try to have a long negotiation and get the parliament to approve agreements so we could have airtight immunities to stay in the country. So um, that was basically dispensed with. I know people in the administration just kept held their breath, hoped the media would never raise it. Um, but uh, on the Iraqi side, Hushar Zabari, who was the foreign minister, told me uh, that what he did was he wrote a letter saying um, the U.S. troops would have the same immunity and protections as people at the U.S. embassy. He did that in his capacity as foreign minister. He didn't even tell Maliki he was doing that. He did it on his own authority, but certainly it didn't have the kind of parliamentary approval and uh, uh, legal um kind of a, a standing that the uh, U.S. had hoped for. So uh, the U.S. proceeded. Um, it all worked out. But I think there's an interesting lesson there about how laws mm -hmm. applied in, in different uh, circumstances. So Obama, he finally decides he's going to re-engage in Iraq. Uh, and then the question becomes, in what way? So the president gives this speech in September 2014 that I kind of alluded to above, in which he says, quote, we will degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL, his word for ISIS, through a comprehensive and sustained counterterrorism strategy. Uh, so what was that strategy that the president adopted and how would it change over time? So first, it has to be said that President Obama was was caught off guard by the ISIS um, seizure of Mosul, notwithstanding the fact that they had taken Fallujah, notwithstanding the fact that the head of the Delta Force had visited um, Iraq in February 2014, and the head of uh, the special operations component of CENTCOM, Mike Nagata, had also visited uh, at that time and sent memos up saying ISIS is coming like a locomotive. The Iraqis can't handle it. The counterterrorism services outmatched. So within the military chain, these warnings were sent up Red Star Cluster. But um, back in D.C., um, they were, you know, they had such an, a range of issues they were dealing with, you know, Egypt and Afghanistan and Syria and Assad and this and that, that they didn't pay sufficient attention to this. When he was caught by surprise and faced the choice of reentering the war, uh, President Obama was basically a, a very um, a controlled, sober, careful, modulated individual and leader. Um, uh, expressed his deep unhappiness in, an, in a somewhat angry way to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and to Lloyd Austin, then the chairman, uh, the head of uh, CENTCOM, in an episode that I have in the book that I've confirmed, but it's never come out before. But eventually they had to face the fact they had to go back in there. So the, what they tried to do is do it carefully. One, they had to have a new Iraqi government and Maliki couldn't be the head of it. Once that was achieved, um, they were prepared to send advisors in to, uh, it was called building partnership capacity, retrain the Iraqi army and advise them so they would do the main fighting. So the concept was, yeah, we're going back in. Actually, uh, Marty Dempsey was in the chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, was told by the White House, no way are we going to send 5,000 troops back in Iraq. Ironic, since by the end of the Obama administration, we had well over 5,000 troops back in Iraq as the campaign grew. But the requirement was they would not be in ground combat. And that was stipulated. Yeah, we're going to have advisors. They're going to be behind the wire. The Iraqis will be out front doing the fighting. U.S. is not going to do the ground combat for them. That's how the cam campaign is going to proceed. And over time, it was just imperative that those... Um, uh, restrictions be relaxed uh, just because they were unrealistic for the kind of um, warfare that we had to engage in. Yeah, you talk a lot about those restrictions on troop deployments, on on how and where the U.S. military advisors could be on the battlefield, on the bureaucrat on the bureaucratic processes that made airstrikes uh, difficult uh, to actually carry out in the early days of the campaign. Um, so who, I mean, the, the process by which these these restrictions were loosened uh, seems to be a very gradual one. Um, sometimes the, the Trump administration gets a lot of credit for the, the kind of, what is it, the rules of engagement being loosened, as it, as it was said. Um, but it, it, 
the way the impression I got from reading the book was that actually this this most of the rules of engagement, as it were, uh, were were relaxed before Trump came into office. Is that how you would characterize it? Well, I would say the rules of engagement actually on the ground were not relaxed. I mean, there was. Um, but what happened is uh, the appetite for risk grew. And so at the start, um, it, it, apart from the Delta Force, which was running around northern Iraq and Syria under Chris Donahue, later became famous as the last man out and is now the 18th Airborne Commander in Europe, led the 82nd Airborne back to Poland after the Russian in, invasion of Ukraine. Um, but um, when at the start, uh, the U.S., we had advisors there, but they were restricted to operating within the confines of large Iraqi bases and the Iraqis would be out there. And um, U.S. commanders, uh, General uh, Sean McFarland, now retired, others uh, kept appealing and saying they needed something called the accompanying authority. We need to send our advisors with the Iraqi troops and not do it remotely so we can get a better picture of what we're up against, call in airstrikes more efficiently, we also want to back them up with Apache helicopters. Um, it's an army system, so it sort of smacks of ground combat boots, but they're even though they're mm -hmm. helicopters. And it took some substantial period of time for the commanders in the field, who are the demandeurs, to get that authority. Ramadi fell in May of 2015 to ISIS before they had that authority. So now you had a situation where well, they took Mosul. Now they took Ramadi. Now what? But uh, President Obama, to his credit, uh, held, um, stuck, you know, with it. And so what happened over time was there was uh, the Obama administration gave commanders. It really didn't ha it didn't happen under Lloyd Austin. It happened under his successor, General Botel at CENTCOM. He gave um, the um, commanders in the field the authority to send advisors with Iraqi, not merely Iraqi brigades, but Iraqi battalions. And it wasn't until the summer of 2016 that a U.S. advisors went with an Iraqi battalion at that level, which was for an operation across the Tigris. As the Mosul campaign unfolded, they needed to expand these accompanying authorities even further. They needed to let the advisors go more forward on the battlefield. They needed to employ um, just to in, and had it needed to even allow them to directly call in fires as opposed to routing it back to a command center. That happened in December 2016 when then General Townsend, who was leading it, issued tactical directive number one. So it took all that time to kind of reach the, the appropriate balance between letting the Iraqis do the main fighting and having advisors on the battlefield. But it all happened under President Obama. Uh, what President Trump did was he executed Obama's strategy. Uh, he didn't, uh, all the things he said he was going to do in the campaign, take the gloves off, bomb the heck out of them, uh, that never happened. He executed Obama's strategy pretty much as he inherited it, with one difference. Um, Obama didn't remove all the constraints. And when he left office, there were still a lot of uh, issues, uh, for example, the military still didn't have as much latitude as it would have liked. And one example is Syria. Uh, General Townsend wanted to set up an Apache base, Apache attack helicopter base in Syria to support the offensive on Raqqa after Mosul, mm -hmm. right? And he could not get the authority to do that because, again, uh, the Obama administration was moving carefully. And so what they agreed is he could have three Apache helicopter, three helicopters in Syria for 72 hours at a time. It was a, a certain degree of micromanagement. And again, it was risk mitigation on the part of the Obama White House, but it was frustrating for the commanders in the field. Um, that kind of thing was removed under the Trump administration by people like H.R. McMaster, who had been on the battlefield, didn't see the need for it. So Trump didn't change the rules of engagement. That never happened. I've talked to all the commanders. They'll tell you that on your podcast. What happened is the White House removed a degree of micromanagement of the campaign okay. that existed under Obama and Susan Rice. And as a consequence, the irony is Trump executed the Obama strategy more efficiently than Obama himself, simply because he, he remained aloof from it. Interesting.
So the United States role, uh, I mean, the United States is front and center in this book, even though we're not the ones uh, doing most of the fighting. And I think you say at the end of the book that only about 20 U.S. service members were killed in all of Operation Inherent Resolve, um, which is pretty pretty in, impressive given how much territory was, was taken back. Um, but it does seem like the United States was critical to this venture. Um, do you think that anything like this could have been done without the United States playing the role that it did? No. And the reason is uh, the Iraqi military was a shambles when the U.S. came back in. The Iraqi leader, Maliki, was um, an impediment to progress political and military in his country. And while the U.S. played a modest role on the ground, it played an essential role because these small teams of advisors, who occasionally did, by the way, engage in ground combat in some limited circumstances, including in West Mosul, but um, they, they enabled the Iraqis to call on U.S. and coalition air power. Uh, they enabled the Iraqis and the Syrians with intelligence. And uh, what defeated um, the Islamic State was not just uh, the, the skirmishing on the ground, but massive amounts of air power. Now, there was a trade-off to this strategy. Our proxy forces, our partner forces, the Iraqi military, the Kurdish Peshmerga, the Syrian SDF, are not nearly as proficient as the U.S. military. And they were well-equipped or deft at maneuver warfare. And so mm -hmm. they required an inordinate amount of firepower to move forward. And, um, and these battles were fought in urban settings, Mosul, Raqqa. And as a consequence of this, um, uh, civilians often were put in danger, not deliberately, not because the rules of engagement were loose, they weren't, but because um, the ground force required a lot of firepower to move forward. And um, I think uh, one of the lessons of the war is gonna be if we do these things again in the future, uh, the military is going to have to come up with a, a better way to try to mitigate civilian casualties. Although, um, you know, the, the, the very concept of this kind of um, strategy um, does create, present a, a certain degree of risk for them. If, if we wanted to reduce the risk to civilian casualties, we uh, further, you know, one way to do it is to use American ground forces uh, less than proxy forces but there are huge political barriers to that in the United States, and we'd be taking more casualties on the military side of our own. Right, and the, the number of, of civilian casualties, including civilian casualties uh, inflicted by the United States uh, via air power is, is pretty pretty stunning, something in the in thousands, I think maybe 8,000, according to one estimate. Um, I wanted to get back to the the partner forces. Uh, you mentioned the in Iraq we had the Iraqi the Iraqi military and the Kurdish Peshmerga, and in Syria we had this Kurdish group called the Syrian uh, Defense Forces, the SDF, which is you know, problematic for a number of reasons, mainly because uh, Turkey, our NATO ally, considers it to be a, a terrorist organization linked to the PKK. Um, but there's another organization we haven't mentioned yet, which isn't necessarily a partner force, though some have, have kind of painted it as effectively one, and that is the, the PMF, or the Popular Mobilization Forces in Iraq. These are the Shiite militias, many of them backed by Iran. Um, and while in the book, so, so far as I've read, they don't seem to be working uh, in coordination with the United States, there are a number of times where you you bring us into these NSC meetings in the White House where President Obama seems to have a, uh, an interest in working more closely with them. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so one striking feature of this war is we not only had a partner force, we had a multitude of partner forces, and they didn't all like each other or even cooperate with each other. So, um, and, and so this is a hydra-headed set of partners. So if you just take the Iraqi military, for example, that's made up of the Iraqi army, the counterterrorism service, the federal police. They all report to different ministries. They didn't really have a strict unified chain of command in Mosul. Um, 
the U.S. just had to deal with that. That was just a fact of life. The counterterrorism service was the best of all of them. That's the one the U.S. created and nurtured during its occupation. But we had advi we had to advise all of them, uh, even though um, they were rivals and uh, claimants for you know authority and resources within Iraq. Then there was the Kurdish Peshmerga, which didn't work well with the Iraqi army. And yet they were both part of the battle for Mosul. Uh, and then, as you pointed out in Syria, it's a Syria actually, it's a Syria Democratic Forces. Excuse um, me. Right. Well, they, I think they came up with the name themselves. Hard to keep track of all their acronyms. And it was a, basically a Kurdish-led force that included uh, some Arabs that uh, was um, dominated by the YPG, which um, for the purposes of this conflict, the U.S. insisted did not have a strong connection to the PKK, which was designated as a terrorist group uh, by the U.S. And somehow the U.S. had to keep all of these. I mean, it was really an extraordinary advisory effort just to to keep this whole thing moving forward. And 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 it meant that at times the U.S. had to bend to local political realities just because uh, you know it's they were fighting the war, and if they wanted to stop, and you couldn't order them forward, and you couldn't. Um, um, they were all, if they wanted to fight Nanbar instead of Mosul, you couldn't, you couldn't tell them to do otherwise. The Iranians had their own by, with, and through program at the, from the very start that Qasem Soleimani himself directed. And he was present in Iraq. In fact, I reveal in the book, he even had an impromptu meeting with the U.S. General Union 3 across from the American Embassy. Um, and, uh, and they were known generically in Iraq as the Popular Mobilization Forces, the PMF, the Hashid. And they really spanned a spectrum from what were called sort of the loyal PMF that worked for the, uh, came from the Jaff and to um, more hardline Iranian elements. Um, in my view, they did not play a decisive role in the fight after the first couple weeks. They were important in the first couple of weeks because the U.S. wasn't there, because it took some substantial period of time to engineer a new Iraqi government for the U.S. to come back in and train them. And in that period, the Iranians were in there providing arms, weapons, militia and uh, support, something that uh, the Kurds will tell you. And um, so but after that, they they weren't because they I, I saw some of these guys, they weren't. Uh, that capable plus we wouldn't support them directly with air power we because they were not under direct uh, iraqi government command so we said look um we'll support the iraqi army we're not supporting the pmf and a huge effort was made to keep them outside of mosul with only there were only a few exceptions when they were inside there because it was felt that these are hardline shia elements and it'll aggravate uh, and irritate the sunnis and that'll um, inflame sectarian tensions and make this mission all the much harder. So the U.S. strategy was to deconflict with these Iranian-backed elements, keep them out of Mosul, not support them with air, and uh, try to marginalize them. By and large, it worked. Um, although, um, you know, in the end, they, they did get into Fallujah, and uh, they did play a role. And... Uh, they're consequential now because their um, ultimate objective was not merely to fight ISIS, but to establish a land bridge from Iran to Syria to supply he Lebanese Hezbollah and uh, elements there with arms. And they were successful in, in that endeavor. But I don't regard them as consequential in the uh, defeat of ISIS. Yeah, I thought that was a, a clarifying omission, if I can put it that way. Um, how much of the focus when it came to the battles in Iraq and, and in Syria was really uh, through our partner forces and that the, the Iranian-backed forces were not were not the principal factor. Qasem Soleimani um, understood that himself, and there was U.S. intelligence. When we, we came back in, there was U.S. intelligence and Qasem Soleimani saying, oh, the Americans are coming back in. They're using this as an excuse to reoccupy Iraq. we got to stop them. But then he had a change of heart. And there was U.S. intelligence saying uh, Qasem Soleimani came to the view. He said, look, the American Americans can fight ISIS better than we can. Let's let them do the dirty work. And then we'll be we'll move in afterwards and um, try to uh, amplify our influence, which is exactly what they tried to do. 
Well, that brings me to my my last question or questions. Um, so we we talked about the campaigns in Mosul and Raqqa. Mosul is taken. Uh, it is liberated in July 2017. Raqqa and Syria falls a few months later in October 2017. It would take a little bit longer uh, till March 2019 till the last bit of ISIS held territory was recovered. That was Baghouz, Syria in, in March 2019. Um, but when it comes to what we have achieved and how successful Operation Inherent Resolve was, uh, I think we have to look at how politically sustainable the outcome that we have helped to generate is. So how, how do you how do you kind of evaluate uh, in your mind the, the success of, of Operation Inherent Resolve when, when we survey the ground of Iraq and Syria today? Well, first, I, I feel like it, there's some military lessons there, which is that if you want to work with a partner force or a proxy force, and it's important to accompany them on the battlefield. You can't do them from inside the confines of large bases. It just doesn't work that well. I think that's an important lesson. Second, um, I think it's good not to allow uh, security vacuums to emerge in the first place. Um, and we have a tendency sometimes to think of uh, a conflict as a so-called forever war. And if we have troops in a foreign place, we, we're not ending the forever war. And I think the way we should think of it is not as a forever war, but as the forward deployment of U.S., a small number of U.S. forces in an area that's strategically important to us to guard against the emergence of new risks. Um, so don't let the vacuum arise in the first place. If you can, go with your partners on the field. Third, um, as I mentioned before, we got to think of a way to mitigate civilian casualties. I wouldn't put this all in the US, U.S. by any means. ISIS used these people as human shields. They wouldn't let them, they kept them trapped in Mosul and Raqqa. Um, they they fought from behind them. They fought from within civilian structures. They, they're they the ones that put the civilians at risk. The Iraqis and the Syrian forces had to dig them out, and it took some significant firepower to do that. Uh, but in terms of sustainability, you, you asked a an absolutely essential question. And um, I think militarily what we have now is sustainable because we haven't pulled our troops out. We still have 2,500 troops in Iraq. Uh, they're inside the wire. They're not going out too much, but they're there. We have about 1,000 uh, troops in Syria and eastern Syria, the East Syrian security area and the Antanf garrison combined. Um, they're still and they're not going anywhere either. Well, we occupy a, a, some territory in eastern Syria where there's the Conoco and some oil interests. Um, uh, there was a lot of toing and froing in the Trump administration who twice ordered the troops out and then twice ordered them back in, but they don't occupy the same terrain that they, they did before, but um, they occupy some important terrain that gives the U.S. a certain degree of leverage in, in discussions about the future of Syria, not unlimited, but not insignificant. But we at least we, at least we didn't make the mistake we made in 2011 uh, in, right. in um, mishandling the SOFA talks and leaving the country. We still have forces there. Indeed, Operation Inherent Resolve continues to this day. It is still literally in existence, um, and uh, it's under the command of a two-star general now, not a three-star but we have a presence. Now, political sustainability. Well, Iraq has its own, going through its own difficult process of government formation. We have to stay involved in that diplomatically and economically and every which way we can. Syria is just a sad, sad story. And under the original concept within the Trump administration, well, originally, the idea was that at the end of this conflict, we would do something called stabilization. It wouldn't be nation building. It wouldn't be reconstruction because that was too much for the American pocketbook and, and the American public to sustain. We tried that in Iraq. It was going to be much uh, less. You know, it was going to be stabilization. It was going to be demining, help them get essential services back, working with the de-ISIS coalition of 80 something nations. Um, and uh, help them get back on their feet. President Trump canceled 
after reading an article in the Washington Post that we were doing destabilization, canceled it. I think we're spending all of a hundred million dollars on it because uh, he didn't want to do it. Demanded other nations pony up, which they were doing anyway. Um, and so the stabilization thing between the Trump administration's dis, uh, Ill, un, ill-advised decision to cancel it against the wishes of Brett McGurk, President Trump's repeated efforts to yank forces out of Syria without consulting with his own commanders about the implications of that, only to leave them there. And when he was told that we'd, we'd lose control of the oil, um, created a lot of chaos. So um, we don't really have a, a, a mature stabilization effort underway. And that would have been important to H.R. McMaster. He was a big proponent of that along with McGurk because when McMaster, due to his own experience in Iraq, believed you needed a, the Army's operating concept should you need a sustainable outcome. Well, we don't have that in Syria. And, um, uh, but um, ISIS has been weakened. Um, and in Iraq, there's a, a certain degree of stability and that's really maybe the limit of what um the u.s uh, can achieve at this time syria as you know from your own experience there we have interventions by turkey a russian presence now the israelis do airstrikes against the iranians the iranians are there with their shia militias the u.s is there it's a kind of a geopolitical star wars bar and i don't think it, it, it its prospects are are particularly promising, as you know, because there's no countries right. that step up to rebuilding it. The areas where the U.S. is not present anymore, Raqqa, other places, are not being reconstructed by Iran or by Russia or by the Assad regime or by um, Turkey or any of these other powers. So. I don't think we, the U.S. should assume all of the blame and responsibility for the mess that persists in Syria now. But it is a situation where, where there isn't a, a particularly good um, outcome. But uh, it has to be said that ISIS has been uh, severely weakened, not eliminated, but weakened. And uh, by all reasonable uh, criteria, you'd have to say, that uh, the inherent resolve campaign was a success, although um, you need to keep your eye on the ball to to um, to see that that particular adversary doesn't reemerge again. So I said that was the last question, but I do have one bonus question. Since since you said that Operation Inherent Resolve continues, uh, where did this name Inherent Resolve come from? Something that you call an ungainly name in the book. Well, if you did a Cole, if you did a poll of American public and you asked them, um, do you support Operation Inherent Resolve? Ninety nine percent of the people in our country would say, what's that? In fact, I if in doing this book, I had to get a quote from a quite senior retired American officer on the record, which I did get on the record. It's in the book. And I said, listen, I'm doing a book on OIR and uh, I want to put your quote on the record. And that guy said, what's OIR? <laughs> so it's Operation Air Resolve. And went, oh, yeah. So, um, uh, in fact, I would say very few people in the country realize it's still underway, even though they, they still carry out missions. There was just a big ISIS prison break in, in, um, in January. In Hasaka. January, and we still do operations to against uh, ISIS emirs uh, and uh, other uh, other notables. But the, the way it resolved, the way the name came about was um, it's a, the reason it's it's a, a clunky name is it's, it, it's a product of the Pentagon bureaucracy. And it, in the US military, when you name an operation, and it's important to have a named operation in, as they call it, in terms of resources, commitment, attention, funding. Um, you can't just go out and name it whatever you want. Um, the Brits always come up with these kind of names that don't mean anything, Gramby or Telic or whatever. But the American names have to sort of mean something. And yet there's a naming convention. And Central Command is allocated certain letters that it, it has to use 
Um, it can name, they have to be, the name should be two words and it can begin with certain letters and the second word can begin with other letters and it has to all be uh, conceived within these kind of strictures. And so the initial name that uh, uh, came up with out there, and I think it was the General Benaric supported it, it was the General of the U.S. Embassy at the time, and was um, Iraqi Resolve, because even though Mosul had, had fallen when the Iraqi military fled the city and handed it over to a couple thousand militants, it was meant to, you know, encourage them to show resolve and take their country back. And, and, and everybody liked that. They socialized it with the Iraqi government. Um, they liked it too, even though they hadn't shown much resolve, but they were, it was, I guess, perspective. And, uh, and, that, and then um, somebody uh, woke up to the fact that this campaign, uh, very early on, was going to go into Syria. President Obama decided in September of 2014 that U.S. airstrikes would have to go into Syria. Um, and then later, uh, we sent special forces in after uh, Kobani. Uh, so um, they said, well, we can't even Iraqi resolve because there's Syria in there too. So then they played with a whole bunch of different names and uh, couldn't really come up with anything. And eventually they settled on inherent resolve, which doesn't really, nobody really liked, but at least it, it didn't leave anybody out. Uh, you were saying it's all about Iraq and not about um, Syria. And so, and that became the name and it's, it's the name today. And um, it, it goes on. And I, I just on, a, on a, a personal note, I'd say it's a, it's a shame that um, the public doesn't know much about it because uh, we've gone through this wrenching setback in Afghanistan, which even General Milley would acknowledge and said was a strategic setback and defeat um after 20 years um you know what do we have to show for it but inherent resolve the counter isis campaign that was a big war um that um americans were killed uh, delta force did some successful operations lots of air was employed some of it maybe hit the wrong target but a lot of it hit the right target and um uh, and it was successful this is a war we actually won and um and we shouldn't forget that. And, uh, and it could have been done better perhaps in places and it was a learning process, but it was actually a successful operation in that part of the world. And those don't come easy. So I think that it's, it's something that um, a lot of sacrifices were made by a lot of people, particularly the people who live there, the Iraqi forces, the Kurdish forces, the Syrian forces, they took enormous casualties, fought in terrible conditions. Um, and um, I, I just think it'd be um, it, my hope anyway, apart from just trying to preserve the history for posterity, would be that there's a, sort of a greater appreciation of that and awareness of that. Um, uh, and, you know, not only of the um, sacrifices the American forces made and the coalition forces, Brits, French, Norwegian. Yeah others in there, but of the people who live there themselves. And what you describe in the book is certainly uh, exemplary of resolve. Perhaps the word inherent means nothing, but certainly uh, all of the people who, who's, who sacrificed their lives um, and limbs uh, demonstrated a high degree of resolve in, in pushing back ISIS. Um, with that, I think we should bring this conversation to a close. Michael Gordon, thank you very, very much for coming on the Caravan Podcast. Once again, Michael's new book is Degrade and Destroy, the Inside Story of the War Against the Islamic State from Barack Obama to Donald Trump. And I do highly recommend it. Please rate and subscribe to the podcast. We will be back soon for the next episode. Thank you. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.